is Avalanche considered legacy? And if so, why? Um, and the point tying into tokenomics is interesting. I actually think that a lot of these next gen chains take a similar view that I was expressing earlier around like the fee mechanism, which is a lot of them are much more interested in just max throughput as long as the fees pay above the DOS rate. And then don't make the validator margin based on fee collection, but rather make it based on inflation of the network. And that the hope is that the growth of the network surpasses like the inflation rate, I guess. I think that's mostly how those are decided. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we are joined by Luigi um, from Avalanche. He is the head of DeFi and developer relations. And we also have Patrick O'Grady, who's the VP of engineering. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having us. I'm yeah, listening we- to uh, your recent podcast lately just to make sure I was ready for this. So we, we should be good to go. Love to hear it. Love to have you guys on as well. I'm in a bit of a bubble. But when I'm thinking of crypto, there's really three ecosystems that I see day to day. And they all have unique use cases. So like one is Ethereum, which is this like maximally decentralized L1. And now they're focusing on like a modular roadmap. Then you have Solana, which is this global synchronized state machine. And then you often hear about app chains, which people... I would say more or less default to Cosmos. Now you have Avalanche, which I think I want to know where does Avalanche fit in that story? What is Avalanche's core thesis? Uh, but to get there, I think it'd be great to just start at a high level, like what Avalanche is and the, the general design um, layout. Cool. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably jump in and then like let Patrick fill in. Um, Patrick tends to be much more detailed than I am. Um, but yeah, Avalanche as a whole is like, you know, um, architecturally, I like to think about it as somewhere uh, in between uh, Polkadot and Cosmos. Uh, that's one way to explain to people. Uh, you know, you don't have, I guess, as free form of an architecture as Cosmos. Uh, you don't have sort of like this very stringent um, sort of architecture that Polkadot has with their parachains. Um, but at a high level, basically the way it works is you have this uh, primary network, uh, which, in, which consists of the P chain, X chain, and C chain. We really, really went for uh, simplicity here. Um, <laughs> And uh, basically, each one of those chains for uh, serve different functions. Uh, the C chain is the one anybody who uses Avalanche has probably used. It's the EVM based chain. Uh, that's where like Aave, Trader Joe, all those types of applications look. The P chain is where staking occurs on Avalanche, uh, and then the X chain is for native asset creation. It probably has like the least amount of usage out of the three chains on the primary network. Um, but those three chains make up a primary network, and all the validators of Avalanche validate that primary network. And then uh, on top of pr- the primary network, uh, basically Avalanche allows this this notion of subnets. Uh, and, and subnets basically are uh, effectively a way to create new um, areas that people can validate at the most generic level. So uh, it can be a blockchain, it can be multiple blockchains in one subnet. Um, but basically, it's a collection of validators agreeing to validate something. Right now, that mainly is uh, a blockchain, um, and it's completely isolated from the primary network, similar to the the idea uh, of Cosmos in a lot of ways, where you have this app chain thesis and sovereign networks. So that that's like a high level uh, sort of architecture, and then we could like dive deep into different different items. So for somebody who is just maybe getting into crypto and trying to you know, form a mental model around Polkadot, Cosmos, Avalanche. You said Avalanche, maybe one way to think about it is between Polkadot and Cosmos, but maybe without resorting to analogies of possible, like how exactly does it fit into the landscape of crypto infrastructure? Like why would somebody pick Avalanche over Cosmos, for example? Yeah, so Avalanche is built for launching really like these custom, sovereign, connected chains. So you may say, well, that sounds like Cosmos. Well, that sounds like Polkadot, right? Uh, The idea is being that um, in the world of Avalanche, um, the the primary network plays a slightly larger role than different ecosystems in that it serves as this registry system uh, for different validators uh, to basically look up different key material about other validators that they may know nothing else about. So in the case of a subnet, um, what that will mean is like, uh, usually if you have like a custom blockchain or something like that, the next biggest question you have is, well, how do I actually communicate with other people doing the same thing, right? If you just come to Avalanche and you launch a blockchain, but you're not communicating with anybody, 
doesn't make a lot of sense to be in that land because the benefits come from like this light connectivity framework that sits behind the, the VM scene. Um, and so what the primary network allows you to do is without actually validating or participating in any other subnet, authorize messages that come from other subnets and then use that data. Um, so it's really optimized for these like kind of separate subnetwork regions, uh, but allowing for very high throughput connectivity between those subregions. Um, yeah. Now, in, in the world of Cosmos, like you have, uh, <clears throat> there's a cost per connection that's formed between different Cosmos zones um, using IBC. So you have to pass headers back and forth between different zones to keep them up to date and the channels up to date to actually pass information, which is why you don't see Cosmos zones connected to every other Cosmos zone. In the world of Avalanche, uh, you have this uh, registry, what we'll call the primary network, that makes uh, each additional point to point connection, uh, no variable or marginal cost, because you just look up the value to validate any messages from the primary network instead of actually having to pass like header information back and forth. So it's more optimized for like a higher fixed cost, low to minimal variable cost messaging system, whereas Cosmos, I would argue, is uh, meant for much lower fixed cost, but the variable cost per, per network connection uh, scales scales quick more quickly. I would say like, um... You know, if I really had to like simplify it and bring it back up, you know, the way I would think about Avalanche as a whole and like what the focus is and, 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 you know, like who directly it's going after, like you want to build your own blockchain, you want to be able to customize it, you come to Avalanche. And the reason for this is number one, you get this super fast consensus out of the box. Uh, two, there are multiple different frameworks that are being built, um, to actually allow you to customize at a very deep level the blockchain that you want to build. Um, so that can be multiple different types of virtual machines. It could be different languages that you want to write in. Uh, you know, like there's, there's just like a whole frontier of, you know, the thesis is that we believe that people will want to customize their blockchains, right? So Solana, you have this super, uh, fast state machine. Uh, and that's like kind of the thesis from, at, you know, from, from my seat. Um, you know, Ethereum has this focus on the EVM and, you know, they're customizing and whatnot, but, uh, and everything rolls up to one chain. Avalanche, basically, it's a bunch of interconnected networks. We believe people will have different ideas on how to customize uh, a blockchain. And then we want to give you the tools to be able to do that. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good overview. Patrick, I think you came straight out of Stanford into the crypto space when you joined Avalanche. You talk about, I know you're extremely technical, when you were looking at other ecosystems at the time, whether that was Ethereum or Solana, like, why did you pick Avalanche? Like, what was it so, like, what fascinated you? <laughs> Yeah, there, were, there was actually a missing gap there where I spent two years at Coinbase, which gave me like a perfect front row seat to like all the cool stuff. Um, so I was on the crypto engineering team there. I actually worked on the integration for Polkadot and Solana and Cosmos. So <laughs> I got to learn all of them from a very uh, deep layer, uh, deep level. I actually had was uh, part of the conversation early on, maybe to the chagrin of some of the Solana folks of like adding timestamps into Solana because that was required for Coinbase's integration. Uh, at that time. So it's, sorry about that. If that is so much people the wrong way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that gave me a really good front row seat to figure out like the different, really the, the technical trade-offs everyone's making. I think in the crypto marketing space, at least, it's really easy to try and pitch or attempting to try and pitch your product as like the silver bullet or like the network as the silver bullet for everything, right? Where it's Limitless scaling, perfect security, like unlimited, you know, whatever, right? And behind the scenes, you take, you know, a few, maybe it takes a few layers of the onion back. There's trade-offs everyone's making, right? Like maybe you're giving off some, like trading off some sort of flexibility and smart contracting for higher performance. Maybe instead, you know, you're trying to um, increase throughput by like raising the minimum requirement for hardware or maybe to a reasonable level of hardware requirement where it's never was a good idea to run things on like four cores or eight cores for a, a global distributed network. So, um, you know, while I was there, uh, I got to talk to all these different teams and really working there. But with, with Avalanche, it came down for me, at least, um, to the uh, architecture and, like, and the consensus mechanism. So at that time, so when I left or when I joined Avalanche, it was January 2021. Uh, the things that really mattered to me at that time were I liked proof of stake because I felt it was a better fit for blockchain than proof of work. Um, I thought that like the ASIC centralizing forces of proof of work um, were really challenging to, to actually deal with. Uh, and so proof of stake, I think, was a better way to actually distribute secure like participation in a network 
uh, without requiring me as like an average person to go buy like a shit ton of ASICs to actually like participate in something like this. But the issue was most like proof of stake consensus mechanisms at that time were uh, like big O, like N squared or even higher in network complexity. Um, and so when I stumbled ac across Avalanche, uh, you know, it had a very different network complexity that I thought made proof of stake much more open and like easier to participate in. I know Solana does um, something very different as well to also make it more e like a make more open uh, and larger uh, staking sets. Uh, but at that time, I think what really first excited me was this whole notion of subsampling. Like many other people, I didn't. It was crazy that it worked. And so as I Sorry, tried to you off, what is uh can you can you explain on what subsampling is? And and actually, I'm I'm gonna go really quick because we touched on you were talking about like O complexity, and I think like something you could think about is Cosmos. They only have 100 to 150 validators because that's you you have to do all to all communication. In Solana, they have something with Turbine where you don't have to do that, and that's why you can have more than 2,000 nodes. And right now at Aval Avalanche, I think you have what's the current node count roughly? I think it's like 1,300 validators. Yeah, which, yeah, or, which is something you couldn't do in Cosmos, for example, because of that all to all communication. Yeah, so I mean, we think that the uh, like the theoretical limit of that is is much higher than what it's currently being used for. But nonetheless, like that, the notion that if you told me in twenty twenty one, like yeah, we're gonna have two thousand validators on a proof of stake network, people would have been like, no, no way, it's just not possible, right? So the first thing, like, because if you if you love everything else about it, but the foundation doesn't make any sense when you join a project, like. You can only go so far, right? And so for me, the first thing was actually getting comfortable understanding what was exciting there. And so to back up, like what's subsampling, what's big up complexity, right? So as you alluded to um, at that time, actually, I know that a lot of this research is always ongoing. So, you know, I may be speaking slightly out of date on like what the state of the art is. Um, but at that time, the typical mechanism for actually like achieving consensus was you have uh, like some slot where you're a block producer. What you'll do is you'll form some block, send that block out to all the other participants in consensus. They'll look at that block, see if it's valid, see if it like builds on the parent they expect, whatever. And then they'll sign it and then send those signatures back to you. So in every step of the consensus, you get this like nice single shot finality property, right? If you get enough signatures back, you can just finalize the data there. But you have this problem where the, the block producer is always this hotspot. Like they, when they're building, they have to be this like focal point for in and out bandwidth for everybody. So, right. Like, let's say that I know that a lot of people nowadays, like just send the transaction IDs out to try and avoid some of this problem. But back then that was not the point at all. And you just sent the whole transaction out. So like, let's say that you had two megabyte blocks and like a thousand participants. Well, <laughs> in like your single slot of a few seconds, you have to now send two megabytes to every other validator on the network. So then get it back off of them, right? So you can see where the bottleneck starts to happen. Uh, in Avalanche, it's different in that what will happen is the block producer will actually send out block a block to the network. And then that's kind of where their port part and like the core operation stops. And then as other people in the network, other validators hear about a block, they then just start asking subsets of the network repeatedly, what do you think? Let's say you have a group of 100 people um, and uh, I get a block. I'm going to go ask 20 random people weighted by stake. What do you think? Oh, you know, 15 out of 20 of you said that that's your preference. Cool. I'll keep track of that. Now, if I do that 20 more times, I will finalize the block. And so in a network where you have like uh, 1,300 validators, when I'm actually verifying or validating a particular block, uh, I may only talk to like 400 people. So you can already see like the sublinear uh, nature of the network complexity there. So that's what first really got me excited about Avalanche. What's cool about that is it allows for uh, sort of like very fast finality um, and, and, and while maintaining an, an, uh, a very decentralized validator set. It's like true finality, like the, tr the transaction is complete, um, you know, theoretically less than a second. In, in hundreds of milliseconds, potentially. 
Yeah, so that's extremely like technically interesting. Now it's like, what does that enable? So one, you said it's quick finality, but also I think you described Patrick why it's important that you can support such a large validator set. Like one reason is like you just want decentralization, right? But right now, I believe anytime you launch a subnet, you need to have validators to essentially secure that chain, right? And then why do those validators also need to be on the P chain? Great question. Uh, something that's currently being actively discussed in the community right now of like how exactly the best way to scale Avalanche is. So right now, and since the growth of the network, um, to be a subnet validator, you had to stake um, at least the minimum stake amount, 2,000 of Vox on the primary network, become a primary network validator. So validate and verify the primary network and then opt in to some sort of subnet and then validate there too, potentially staking whatever staking token it has as well. Now, the reason for that, right, is um, on the P chain is actually stored two really important pieces of information. First, uh, it is your stake weight in the subnet. And then two, it's like key information used uh, to actually verify, uh, you know, your ability to send messages to other subnets. And so from a security perspective, uh, you could understand why some subnet validator or something like that would think it's important to actually like validate that information and like uh, let their stake weight there. Additionally, uh, you need to be able to look up that information as a as like a subnet validator actually like participate in the subnet because the like the pro the proposal ordering on the subnet is dependent upon the stake weight on the primary network. So you need to be able to like look that up. And so if you're not syncing that, you can't actually look that up, and then you can't actually participate in the subnet. Now, what we figured out later on was that you really actually only need to verify the P chain to do that. And so there's been um, some proposals lately, uh, at least discussed, to change this a lot uh, and actually make it so that if you're a subnet validator, you don't actually have to be a primary network validator uh, for obvious reasons, which is like, if you're trying to scale a subnet to like max throughput, it's kind of weird that you have to also sync the C chain at the same time, right? Like, kind of goes against that uh, the, the idea that you could actually maximally scale your your subnet accordingly uh, but that's been one of the biggest things also because uh, the stake requirement means that like creating a subnet becomes very expensive relative to the like competing options and so for large companies where we've seen a lot of subnet adoption it's not really that meaningful of an amount like if for whatever business they're going to create but if you're trying to create a startup like you'd much prefer the variable cost uh, that you could get with an l2 over like this higher fixed cost to actually launch this stuff in. I don't know if that answers yeah. your question, but I wanted to make sure that was clear. <laughs> I would just like add one one part. Like I think like in the question, it's really like what's the point of even like pulling these validators? Uh, kind of and, and and I think it's a great I think it's a great question. Um there's like a real like so I think one of the reasons people like get excited or like like the idea of L2s is like you don't have this like bootstrap problem um of of like creating your own network one of the one of the ways to alleviate that is to already have an existing validator set interested in validating uh, other networks right so basically the primary network starts as this hub uh all those validators are clearly interested in validating uh avalanche and now there are ways to create uh interesting incentive mechanisms to get them to validate your sub uh so i think it's how do i pull validators uh, to also validate my network uh, it, it, you know, this sort of theory is well behind it. That makes sense. Um, God, I have so many follow up questions. Um, uh, let me think. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll ask the, I'll ask two, 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 um, two first. Um, one, Patrick, I'm actually <laughs> curious. You called it AVAX. I call it AVAX. Is that just curious on the correct pronunciation? Two, um, while we're on the topic of validators and the, the coin itself, so the Ethereum community, or maybe the Ethereum Alliance community, let's say, is quite big on deflationary money, right? Ultrasound money. And maybe Solana community isn't so big on it. It maybe cares more about, well, we actually just want businesses building on top and then they'll take care of the network. How does like Avalanche think of the, the AVAX coin and value accrual to the L1 token? I'll touch on the first one, which is <clears throat> the joke I always tell people is, I have like English second second language, but I don't have a first language. So like <laughs> I'm not I wouldn't really stick to my pronunciation or usage of any particular series of series of words. Uh I uh on the fee mechanism one though, I'll I'll let uh, Luigi take the lead on that one. I think that's been something that he's been more uh 
uh, I think touched with the community about my, my belief more so, obviously. When you're talking about tokens, you got to preface it and say, like, these are my views, not the views of anyone else or whatever, right? So, but uh, I think I'm more aligned with the Solana way of thinking where like fees to me are more about like a DOS uh, resistance mechanism and like on a high throughput network, right? Like you, you want to try and minimize that fee to like increase the amount of usage on the network. Um, the idea of like trying to bake in like some sort of like deflationary scheme into the actual uh, like fee mechanism gets kind of weird, right? Because then you're, as you try to increase throughput, like the fee may not no longer be reflective of like the actual load or like the cost to actually process that amount of transaction load on the network. So I'm more am interested in saying set the minimum fee to whatever is required to prevent a DOS on the network. And then from there up, like it should just be market set uh, based on load above what is the uh, preferred target. So I take maybe a very reductionist engineering view of the, uh, of the situation, but let's see what Luigi has to say. Yeah, so uh, I call it AVAX. Um, everybody calls it AVAX. Uh, I don't know why. We're clearly crushing branding. Um, Luigi, do you say finance as well instead of finance? I go back and forth with both. <laughs> but I the think the term is, is Avalanche. I, Avalanche. Think it's also, yeah. I love it. Well, we call it Avalabs instead of Avalabs. I think that's why like the Avalox stuck to me. Um, I don't know. Just a, a, a vax sounds so like intrusive. I don't know. Don't love it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, on, on this like whole topic, I, I think it's, it's funny. Like in this space, we go through cycles of thought, you know, like, there are times when it's like really great to think about tokens and tokenomics. There's times where it's like, you know, not cool at all, you know, and, and, I, and I find that to be interesting. But when you're building crypto uh, economic systems and blockchains, like the economics do matter at some point. Um, they don't only matter, but they do matter. Uh, so like I'm not, I would say like aligned. I'm clearly not aligned. You know, I don't get those types of likes and, and tweets uh, from, from the aligned community. but. Uh, I'm clearly not aligned with like the idea of, you know, how do we, how do we build the system to optimize just for value accrual? Because like, I got think you're going to hit, uh, you know, like, you know, basically you're going to hit like, uh, a lot of inertia with people building on your system at a certain point. Right? Like if it costs me like $30,000 a day to in like East just to roll up to the L1 every day, like, I don't know, how, how, how long can I do that for? Uh, so there's generally like a balance there. Um, uh, but at the same time, like these systems are proof of stake systems. The value of the, of the network does actually play a key role. And if you want people to validate the network, they need to be profitable and they can't only be profitable by minting free tokens in inflation every year. Like that's not sustainable. <laughs> so you need to eventually have uh, revenue for the network that can compensate for people running hardware. Uh, at the end of the day, there needs to be some margin there. I think it's going to look a lot like real estate uh, one day where you're basically like renting a bunch of properties and there's some sort of like cap rate that you generate. Uh, I think this will be sort of similar and it'll like tend to move to a certain direction. But like Avox in general, the, the value of coal is like really like in a few different ways. And this is not like, you know, any type of advice or legal advice or whatever. Um, but uh, basically the way it's currently designed is that the more subnets that you have, the more Avox you lock up because every single validator needs to stake uh, that Avox component to validate a subnet. So uh, that like ties down supply and then all fees basically on the private network are burned uh, currently. So that reduces the supply of the token, uh, which I think is similar to Solana in, in a lot of ways. Um, but like the way I kind of view it really is like build value from these things. Uh, I think like L1s uh, and people having their own blockchains are actually going to be more common once we get regulatory certainty because the token and the value of cruel to the token is actually quite an interesting mechanism you can design around. Like all these mechanisms were designed like five years ago um, and, and they're quite old, frankly, and need a refresh. Um, but I do think like, you know, there's going to be a time period where that's you know, a great thing to do and, and like will become pretty obvious, but we'll see. It's definitely an unpopular. Thing. 
Yeah, no, I, I love that take. I am curious, Luigi and Patrick. So on this show, we do cover a lot of Solana projects. We, we you know, Mertz in the Solana ecosystem, and a lot of people would call Solana, Sui, and some others like a next gen chain. Um, and then you might hear some people actually say Avalanche in some way is like a legacy chain, um, even though it literally launched in 2020. <laughs> so I would say it's it, it's hard to call that legacy. I'm curious how you'd answer that. So like. Just from the economic side, I think you can point to a few things. So like AVAX or AVOX has like a cap supply of 720 million, which I just, it is interesting because you saw a lot of projects do this and it's hard with immutability, but it's like, oh, we took what Bitcoin had and it was like a fixed, you know, supply and we're going to apply that here. And I think you could probably get onto the Ethereum community. It's like, look, they're really just taking from the Bitcoin community of having like this low block space, low throughput. Um, And you can kind of see that in the economics of Avalanche and some other um, ecosystems. And then also, like, I think there's 100% of the fees are burned. So it's really hard when you're developing an e- ecosystem, but in crypto, you're like locked into what, what you made a decision on day one. But I'm curious, also just on, on the software side, how would you describe to someone like why Avalanche is not a legacy chain? Like you're using the EVM, which some people are like the EVM's out of date. But then you see somebody like Monad, who's trying to bring parallel execution, isolated fee markets. So I'm just curious, like, what are you working on? How would you describe to someone that's like, uh, uh, Avalanche is a little outdated at this point? I'll I'll jump in real quick and then let Patrick dive. Uh, but basically, like uh, one way to think about it is like all these next gen next gen blockchains, um, they're like optimizing on the virtual machine front in a lot of ways. Uh, and basically, what Avalanche allows people to do is optimize on the virtual machine front for their own blockchain. So we kind of view it as like we're providing this like network of networks with. Uh, the communication layer being, hey, you have a validator set and I have a validator set, and we could talk to each other with only our two validators involved, right? So you kind of have this really clean communication uh, uh, sort of mechanism in a world where bridges are not, not you know, like still to be determined how, how successful. Um, and like ultimately what we want to do uh, is allow people to, let's say, for example, somebody has a specific use case and they want to use something like the SVM. SVM is super optimized, but it's a super optimized state machine. Maybe they want to tweak it in different ways. Maybe they want to optimize it for one specific type of use case. That's something that, that that's where we are 100% focused. And that's where Patrick's time's basically been focused lately. You can talk about more. I, Patrick, I have to ask a question since it's so relevant this week. You know, Rune made that post about forking the SVM into their own app chain. How would you... Sorry for like, I know I'm hijacking this question, but how, how would you go to Rune and be like, no, you should do this with Avalanche because if you can use that SVM there, like I assume the first pushback would be like, hey, I don't want to stake on the P chain. Or so like, how would you make that selling point to Rune? I mean, so as we alluded to earlier, like that, that is like one of the biggest concerns of like people that are actually trying to launch their own sovereign chain is like, they feel like the existing fee mechanism to actually do that on Avalanche makes it less than sovereign relative to what you could do otherwise. And I think that the big change once we actually have that capability is this like native messaging out of the box. So a lot of the issues of that blog post that people call out were like, well, how do you bridge it back to Ethereum, right? It becomes this code processor. Now you have this like trusted bridge somewhere between the SBM and like the Ethereum world. And that is exactly the thing that Avalanche solves with warp messaging, which is like the native ability to actually message between them. I think there's a fair point there, which is to say, well, if you don't want the EVM and you want some adi- like alternative virtual machine that has higher throughput, we don't have like a tested, battle-tested solution that's been out for a few years of production that lets you achieve that. So like his choice from that perspective on like what actually exists, I don't think is that unreasonable for like their, their given goals. My job, hopefully, is to change that. <laughs> so, like, uh, when you talk about, like, you know, why is Avalanche, it's a good question. Like, is Avalanche considered legacy? And if so, why? Uh, and the point tied into tokenomics is interesting. I actually think that a lot of these next gen chains take a similar view that I was expressing earlier around, like, the fee mechanism, which is a lot of them are much more interested in just max throughput as long as the fees pay, do- like, pay above the DOS rate and then don't make the validator margin based on fee collection, but rather make it based on inflation of the network. And that the hope is that the growth of the network uh, surpasses like the inflation rate, I guess. I think that's mostly how those are designed. I'm not going to touch more on the tokenomic side of it, but I will touch more on the engineering side of it, which is that there's definitely interest, right, in saying, 
Well, if you're going to different, differentiate yourself from EVM, how are you going to do it? Is it going to be building a bigger ecosystem? Well, that's pretty challenging given that the, like, EVM has been around for like a decade or almost a decade now and has all these built-in tools. You're probably not going to win there, or if it is, it's going to be very expensive. So what else can you do? Well, you can just try to increase the throughput or like make it possible to like explore different areas of the crypto design space that you haven't been able to explore before because of the fee regime or because of the like inherent technical limitations of the virtual machine you're using. And so uh, on Avalanche, what we think we're really well positioned for in this world is fixed fee scaling for blockchain creators. So when you're talking about actually like creating a blockchain um, and you want like connectivity to a different ecosystem, almost every other aspect of that is a variable fee scaling. So if you want to launch an L2, right, you don't pay like one slot time to launch the L2 and then you just get that throughput, right? You pay it based on how much you do if you actually want to be considered a true L2. If you want to use data availability and still you have to pay for the amount of like actual space you're using. Um, Avalanche was designed from the beginning to avoid this problem in particular, which is to say if you're doing like massive scaling, you probably don't want to pay another ecosystem a variable rate of that amount of scale you're using. And so when people are talking about like, well, is the primary network considered legacy? <clears throat> I don't know if that's true. I think the idea of like scaling the primary network on an EVM may be considered a legacy idea, but that was never the goal with Avalanche. The goal with Avalanche was let's build three different virtual machines, build a framework that sits beneath them so we can actually understand what VMs do in, in general, and then expand that virtual machine interface to be useful more generically to scale on subnets and then connect them via this messaging layer. Um, so I think we could be considered legacy, maybe from the perspective of thinking that we can't maintain one massive global state. And I think that Aptos and uh, SUI have taken the approach of, you know, we can scale out the mempool in some interesting and new ways. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, we can achieve this like crazy scaling by like phase uh, phased execution of different components and like the way that we synchronize the mempool and actually maintain a global state with a throughput of like 150,000 TPS or whatever they're claiming uh, these days. So our approach instead is to say, sure, but what if you want to go above that? Like, what if we're talking about like this massive world and you could say, well, you know, the technology that we're building on will continue to increase in capacity and then, you know, that will allow us to scale past that. Um, our view would say is great. Now do that for every subnet. You know, like it's like, well, you can have 10 of those now versus one. Um, and that we hope, and I think, I think the big bet is to say, warp messaging that allows you to communicate between these subnets will be seamless enough that it won't be too cumbersome. Now, you may disagree with that or people may disagree with that as it becomes, you know, as it becomes like managing a global state. And I think that's really the decision point for a lot of people. You, you touched on L2s and I, I, maybe I, it's time to go a little into the state of Ethereum or maybe the EVM. Uh, Luigi, uh, I mentioned Ethereum alignment earlier and uh, me and you both both had a little chuckle. Um, you guys have probably been criticized more than anyone I'm aware of in the EVM ecosystem from the EVM community. Um, and to be completely honest, I'm not too sure why. Like, I'm, I'm somewhat ignorant in this topic. Um, so I'm curious, like, you know, there's all these talks of Ethereum alignment, you know, uh, the Ethereum Foundation had this saying on their website, which they actually removed recently, was that the only way to solve the blockchain trilemma is VL2s and Ethereum yeah, firmly aligned on, on doing this. Um, obviously, you guys are doing this. Um, and, and so, like, I'm curious, like, what do you think about L2s um, in their current state and just the design philosophy of this, you know, uh, L2s uh, and, and, you know, the the OP, like the super chain thesis, Polygon, and maybe they kind of took a shot at you guys with like supernets with like in terms of the naming. Like, how do you just, just, just. I, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, I got you. <laughs> um, look, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the core founding team and, and members of Avalanche are from the Ethereum ecosystem where I started um, from the very beginning. We went to like every Ethereum meetup back in like Brooklyn in like 2016, 17, is at those consensus warehouses. Uh, Emin, who's, you know, obviously the founder of Ava Labs, uh, um, you know, was famous uh, for a lot of reasons for helping identify the DAO hack 
and Ethereum and, and also, uh, you know, write the selfish mining paper with Bitcoin. Uh, he actually built an L2 a long time ago, uh, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, but I think like we're generally, uh, you know, we've taken a pretty in the past aggressive approach in terms of calling out maybe some of the issues with L2s. Um, and, you know, I don't think we were very liked for that, uh, frankly. And, you know, maybe we didn't have the best tone on, on, on actually handling that, uh, that conversation. But I do think a lot of the points made were actually quite, were quite like prescient, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and th- those, you know, some of those points are simply like, you know, L2 scaling, um, you know, while I think can be interesting for, for certain use cases, uh, in particular, uh, is not the, at least in my opinion, I'll speak for myself. It's not like the, um, uh, the only way to scale. Uh, and it comes with certain limitations, right? So uh, I don't fundamentally believe in a system that settles down to one system. I think that that creates sort of like this house of cards um, and, and effectively like creates a lot of concentration risk, uh, you know, because if everybody's sort of selling to one entity or one chain and that one chain, you know, since it's only, it's less than a year old in terms of a proof of stake chain, has any issues, then, you know, you can kind of run into sort of some severe problems effectively. Like the internet isn't really built that way. There's a lot more fault isolation uh, in it. So from that perspective, I fundamentally just don't agree with that. Um, and, and, and you know, the other thing is like, I don't fundamentally agree with the fact that people will want to pay rent uh, forever in perpetuity to one chain. Like economically, I don't think that's like a necessarily a viable uh, strategy for every entity. For example, like, if you want to build your own blockchain, let's just say you're you're cool with the app chain thesis, you want your own chain, uh, you know, you could do it as an L2, you could do it as a subnet. Uh, as a subnet, you know, you know, uh, you're basically owning your own uh, domain. Uh, as an L2, you're basically renting your domain. So you're and you're sort of like extracting your value out to somebody else, um, you know, in exchange for, I guess, alignment and security. And uh that's that's something that I don't think people will really value uh, in in like maybe five to ten years. So uh, there's a lot of other things, but you know that's that's fundamentally like some of the some of the issues I have. From a from a technical level, I'm super in on like the idea that you can like compress computation and like reduce the load on the rest of the network doing so. So like whether that be optimistic or whether that be zk, I, I think we're more preferential to the zk approach to that, which is yeah, I mean, if you can find a way to make ZK fast enough, then like I think the architecture of blockchains will be pretty redesigned, right? Like the producer will just like actually like generate this proof, or maybe some like group of people will generate this proof, and the verification it looks very different than it does today. Uh, now, the concern I think like comes down to this like notion that the I think the group thing that bothers me a bit is like that the idea that you'd want to provide your own security makes you like completely idiotic like why the hell would you want to do that and um i had like a kind of like a tweet thread queued up for this and i was like i don't know <laughs> like people are gonna start riding here we go again <laughs> what that mean? here we go again <laughs> so i mean i've kind of i don't know it just doesn't seem it's not great it's, it hasn't been like a very fun or interesting conversation because i think people are pretty set in like their belief of like what makes sense for them um but it's like the same sort of conversation to me just played out again with like Ethereum when it actually started versus Bitcoin. It was the same idea. It's like, well, why do you need another chain? Like just use Bitcoin. And then now Ethereum is saying the same thing. Like, why would you need another chain? Just use like Ethereum for everything. And it's the same notion, which is, well, you can't have your own community then. And then the pitch is like, well, you just, why would you want that? Just like use the same community. We've already built a community. Use ours, right? And it goes against the ethos of like how humans build things, which is create a community. Like you need a community of people that are super excited about what you're building. And so for people getting started where they don't have maybe the budget to create like a security, like a secure framework or like bootstrap their own security, I totally get it. Like if I'm a startup, five people, and I'm trying to create some like new product and my biggest blocker, I need my own chain is actually convince people that's safe. You know, I, I could understand why you would go the L2 route. But to say that, like providing your own security is not a way to like build systems or like solve the blockchain trilemma. I think it's a little further than I would, I would take that conclusion. That's all. 
Yeah, the funny, the funny one I would say is like, if you think of a world in like Uber chain or Facebook chain or whatever, like just like, let's pretend that we made it, uh, you know, like if we get to that reality, the idea in my mind that like Uber chain or Facebook chain or whatever these chains are going to like pay rent to some exogenous chain and leak all that value is like really, really, I think of this situation, they will accrue that value to themselves and to their own, uh, to their own community and network. At least that's, that's my thesis. I would like to say though, just before we wrap up this topic, I think the Ethereum foundation has done a great job of pushing really interesting research for the entire space that I think a lot of people have benefited from. And so I will say that, like, I think that a lot of their, there are a number of research efforts they're currently pursuing and have worked on productionizing that I think have, you know, really made it, made it easier to build your own blockchain or build your own ecosystem. So I do want to just give credit where credit's due. At least we've, we've, I've talked a lot to the Get team, at least, and I, I think they're very good. So it's been great to get to know them and you know, learn from what they've figured out. Yeah, me and Mert feel the same way. We often talk about, though, you hear people say there's going to be, you know, millions of app chains that come up or, or like roll ups. And, and maybe there will be. But I think a lot of people just won't care if you launch an app chain. Um, like I was talking about D 2 C companies yesterday. Like, sure, you can get off Amazon and launch your own store. But like nobody's going to go visit it for the most part. If you're Apple, people will go to your website. So it makes sense. Or somebody like DYDX, it makes sense to have your own app chain, right? You don't need to be composable with other chains. I am curious, how do you see the future of avalanche evolving so right now you have the c chain where a lot of the DeFi activity takes place then you have the subnets when you have new protocols and or not protocols when you have new projects and builders coming to avalanche do you think there will be this whole 1 million app chains or i should say subnets or do you think it's more likely that there might be a few like sector specific subnets where everything aggregates because most things to me are power law outcomes and and with that like what's the future of the c chain like does that just go away if you're successful because everyone's doing subnets and they're creating these sector specific communities. How do you see it evolving over time? I think C chain is like our liquidity hub. Uh, it's where the most security is in the network. I think with warp messaging, uh, as you sort of grow uh, effectively all the subnets, they're going to leverage that liquidity. They're going to want to hop through it to communication. So I think that's just going to naturally um, sort of like exist and persist. Um, I, I, I have like a view that you will have a lot of op- app chains, um, like that, that's fundamentally a view, but I don't think people will be exposed to them though. Like, I don't think they'll know that they're there effectively. Um, so I, I, I just kind of think that from the user perspective, they won't know if they're using Facebook change or, or Twitter chain or whatever. Um, you know, what we're focused on is really the developer experience and customizing those chains. And then like a lot of the conversation I have is around like enterprise and institutional use cases for subnets. And that's been a very, very big focus. Like those entities want their own blockchains, then it's full stop. And, um, you know, they want to be able to, to curate and sort of restrict the validator sets uh, from different jurisdictions. They want to be able to have some control over the network in terms of like, and when I say control, what I mean is like, you know, uh, we want uh, the validator set to be able to determine who can actually deploy a contract on the chain. Uh, we want, you know, all these different types of things. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot more on the institutional enterprise side when it comes to Avalanche. Like we're very focused uh, acutely there. And then for the builder market, uh, I think there's things like the Hyper SDK, which Patrick could talk about, which is like, you know, how do we give people the tools to build their own blockchains and customize them with high throughput? Yeah, I, I agree with your premise of like the power law aspect of things. Like, like will there be a, a thousand like really popular, useful chains? Well, hopefully someday. But I think initially, like the um, and I think Cosmos has talked about this at length. Actually, is like the actual like cost of like building your own network and maintaining that and like really fostering that community. It just takes a lot of energy, and you need a lot of people to to build those communities out. Um, and so like, I think initially, like, you know, the community has to be self-sustaining enough that it can like incentivize its own growth really with like this notion of their own staking token and everything like that. Um, and I, so I think it'll be more of a walk and run situation. Uh, but I think that a lot of the communities will get bootstrapped from, as Luigi mentioned, the C chain kind of liquidity hub, which is you'll be able to basically take a Vox or any other token from the C chain and then bring it into your subnet natively with ward messaging. Uh, which will allow people to like pay tokens. You could have a subnet, for example, that just pays tokens and like fees in USDC if you want to. I don't know. Dangerous to like base the 
primary token of a sub net on like a ERC-20 that it can like lock phones and everything like that. But nonetheless, it's possible, similar with Avalanche as a native token. Um, but I think that uh, our, our view with Warp is that it's not maybe the number of subnets that matter, which hopefully there will be a lot, but the thing that will matter is like how connected, like connected they are. And we think that there will be high message throughput between different regions of state. Um, and I think that's maybe one thing that we hold very true for the same reason that you'd want like one massive global state, right? It's like, usually you have a blockchain to like permissionlessly interact with other people. And if you take away that aspect of things, it gets a lot less interesting, I think. And so, um, the warp hopefully allows that, but on a very different kind of basis, maybe um, you could argue. So if I'm to somewhat summarize or distill your guys' points uh, or Patrick's early points about like, you know, if you're a startup, you can kind of understand why somebody would go the L2 route. But if you're like a big business like Uber or something, it makes much more sense probably to go with something like Avalanche for your own blockchain. Um, would you say you guys are mostly focused and I think, Luigi, you kind of said this was a big focus for you guys as well. But like, it, it seems like this is more of a B2B play um, in, in terms of like your go-to-market. Um, first of all, would you say that's accurate? But second, I'm curious, like, what are some use cases you guys have seen so far uh, that kind of excite you on Avalanche? I want to caveat the first point, which is I think that uh, that point I made is true with the current like feed pricing mechanism of the chain. The hope is to make it more accessible to smaller companies that um, can't afford like a large upfront commitment of capital. Uh, so the hope is to make it more accessible to that community. But I would say right now uh, that the subnet um, like trade-off for that is uh, kind of like a fee or like a pricing that's like really a factor above, I think what you can get from a roll up to begin with. So uh, I want to just caveat and say, I think that's true now, but something that we're very interested in exploring to see how we can actually make it more appealing to startups. But uh, I'll turn it yeah. to you on the use cases for it. I would say like B2B is definitely a big focus, but you know, uh, as Patrick outlined, like we're, we are acutely focused on making subnets as accessible as possible to people because we, I think we've proved at this point, like they could be unleashed. People, people like them, they're stable, they work, they're customizable. So. Now we're going to get to a point where we're, you know, hopefully, you know, you know, the community can figure out a way to actually make them more accessible when that happens. You know, it's not going to be just a B2B conversation. Like we're going to want uh, all people, you know, startups, uh, builders, just tinkering to actually, you know, play around with the customizability of subnets. Like that's a lot of what the Hyper SDK is about uh, and that movement. Uh, on use cases, we've seen interesting things. Uh, a lot of them are to launch this year, but, you know, um, on the institutional side, we've seen, like, we launched this first test net, which is basically, like, uh, in conjunction with Wellington, t uh, Wisdom Tree, and other institutions, you're basically using DeFi for TradFi assets uh, with KYC guarding of the chain. Uh, so that's a subnet. Um, you're seeing people, like, do different things, uh, like, basically trading FX with uh, in a concentrated liquidity order books, you're seeing um, sort of like uh, collateralization of different types of TradFi assets and borrowing against it. Um, so basically, that's mainly focused on uh, how do we fix our really broken architecture in TradFi using some of these DeFi blocks. Uh, and then there's like all these different types of gaming and enterprise use cases um, that are using subnets like uh, Godzilla is going to be an Xbox PlayStation game that uh that has a subnet in the back end for owning your own assets that should be launched i think you know sometime this quarter or next uh there's like uh dsm um, you guys are probably pretty familiar with um uh, is launching their blitz app as a subnet which is gonna be pretty cool loyalty points for gaming uh so th there's just like a lot of different use cases like that and and those type of entities really want the ability to to have their own state at least in today's world the less technical view I have on this is more so, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the crypto spaces hope is that most of the, what we'll call like the state transitions or like actual like modifications to state that you interact with in your daily life happen in this like open and like verifiable way. And the hope with subnets and avalanche is that it like becomes the cloud of like the 2020s and beyond where like you can launch, you know, whatever easy to or server backend you want to. Uh, and doing that 
lets you actually process or like power your application or whatever you're trying to do in, uh, you know, really a, a, a very different way uh, from that from that perspective. So similarly to uh, launching your own server, like you might have Windows, you might have Linux, you might have, you know, whatever other variant of Linux that suits you. And uh, I think that uh, like if you wanted to wrap it up in a nutshell, that was a little less technical would be the idea that you kind of deploy your own backend, but on a blockchain. And if, if you're going to take that view, that deployment surface should be pretty flexible in terms of whatever you'd actually want to put there. Yeah. Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about Dr. SDK, what, what, what we're building there? Because I think like that go like that shows, I guess, really the route that we're going, uh, you know, rather than us saying it. I think like this goes into the story that we brought up earlier around like the EDM and like what it means to Avalanche um, and like what it's meant, right? Like it's definitely helped bootstrap the initial ecosystem of like people actually using the framework they're familiar with. Uh, but I think I, I listened to the Monad podcast you guys did um, where they talked about like they very much have to fit their optimizations in the box of that allows EVM compatibility. So like, for example, I think there was a point made about like Solana where it specifies like kind of the state that it's going to touch ahead of time and like the transaction formats are totally different. But in their model, they have to maintain like this STM, or, like software transactional memory model where they actually have to like, you know, optimistically process things to try and achieve like parallelism. Um, and I think that boils up to the, the single point, which is, um, you know, for a long time when people ask, like, you know, we've, we've, even in this podcast, we've been like, some it's this, some it's that, like, you know, you launch your own some whatever. And the pitch being that, like, you know, it's really exciting to launch your own chain. But when we had this, like, kind of set of chains people could launch, usually it was just the EVM. And so the people are like, well, can, like, what else can you do? And it's like, well, uh, you know, you could build your own blockchain, but like, or you can launch the EVM and everyone just wanted to do the EVM for the same reasons they would launch the EVM now, which is like the ecosystem out of the box capability. So uh, about a year ago, I had a hard look in the mirror. I was like, you know, I'm telling everyone to launch your own blockchain. Like, is it actually that easy to launch your, like build your own VM? And no, it's not. Spoiler alert. Um, and so I built a few of my own on top of Avalanche. And it was, uh, there's a lot of nuance to it um, to actually make it work well. And so um, the vision here is that uh, trying to create a framework that allows other people to actually like launch high throughput chains. Um, and so the Hyper SDK is focused on that, which is like an EVM alternative. It has nothing to do with EVM whatsoever. It's all built from scratch for Avalanche um, to achieve a much higher throughput, similar to what you would want to achieve on something like Solana or something like that. But if you wanted to build your own thing, uh, you don't want to fork a whole chain itself. You want to typically have like some sort of framework. You can just like import the pieces and use. Um, and so it's built much more around that idea, which is, you know, maybe you want to achieve some sort of throughput, but like you... Uh, you don't care about some stuff like you you trust the framework to handle like maybe the batch signature verification right like uh, you don't know what that is or care about why that exists um and so yeah it's just built based on that framework which is that a lot of people want a much better or much different transaction or a throughput per dollar ratio than what i think the evm in its current form is willing to provide um, there's very different trade-offs with that. Like we mentioned at the very beginning, like you are making a lot of trade-offs by picking different aspects of the design space, but some people care only or exclusively about how to actually minimize, uh, like the cost, both as an operator, as well as, uh, for users. Patrick, it's a little bit more technical, but, um, at a high level, I'm just curious when you have these different BMs and something like Avalanche, can they actually still communicate to each other? Or is it something like you have clusters? So let's just say you did have SVM virtual machines in Avalanche. Are those really the only ones that can talk to each other? Or could you somehow have an EVM talk to, you know, SVM and so forth? It's the same. It's the same kind of question of like the, what IBT tries to provide for Cosmos, which is warp is just a bytes framework. So you basically just pass arbitrary bytes. And if you understand the bytes and I understand the bytes, we can communicate. But the warp framework itself is like generic enough, which is just authorizing or verification uh, of bytes. So what we haven't seen yet in the Avalanche community really is someone to take the lead on a framework there that makes sense for Avalanche. I think there's some groups that are working on like an IBC connector for some sort of subnet. But I think the IBC framework, you know, when I looked into it, you know, they may say otherwise, like I think is very focused on the Cosmos SDK with this notion of like, you know, messages go to routers and hubs and app parts of the like Cosmos SDK that makes sense. And it, it's pretty confusing to like try and map that to like a totally different world of VMs. And so we want to have a little bit lighter of a message passing framework. 
So I think initially the high press CK will actually speak um, ABI to communicate with the C chain is probably what will happen. But yeah, you have to agree on the message format for it to be compatible, just to be clear. We are seeing like um, th 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 there is some momentum, I think, on people exploring different virtual machines on Avalanche Week. I think there's a team building a move based on that. Um, you know, I've uh, I've seen you know obviously with Hyper SDK and you know Hyper VMs, those are non EVM uh, subnets. Be excited to see SVM subnet, but trying to will it into existence. And I don't I don't know how many people on the planet understand the SVM enough. Maybe just Neil. <laughs> and, yeah, he's and pretty Adoli, good at that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. The one that thing that the Hyper SDK does not have it needs is like a Helios like RPC system. Uh -oh. because, like it doesn't store <laughs> any archival <laughs> stuff. This is the BD train in action, baby. So, I mean, like, I think what you guys are doing is really interesting, like how you've like abstracted a bunch of the node out of the system and like have based on like actually more scalable hardware behind the scenes. And the hyper SDK is very much based on the idea that you as a validator, like you're not going to keep that on your disk. Like it's going to slow everything else down, like just get it out as fast as possible. And I think we're still looking for people to actually be on the other side of that, get it out as fast as possible and turn it into like a queryable, scalable RPC layer. So um, something that One stuff. maybe I can convince you of at some point. You know, that's, that's fun. I um, I remember seeing the hyper SDK thing come out first and uh, I, I read about it a little and I was pretty excited about it. I, I think I actually tweeted about it, which is, uh, you actually might've met. Um, you've touched, so something that kind of piqued my interest there, Patrick, you, you, you mentioned like, you know, just being able to deploy like in an EC2 instance, essentially, right? And we've touched on this word community quite frequently in this in this podcast. One thing that I always find interesting about blockchains is that you would think that they're like purely technical things like cloud infrastructure, like, you know, AWS or something like that. But there's a, this weird, bizarre community aspect of it that I can't quite explain, uh, which influences a lot more than it probably does in any other industry. Uh, like, you know, Avalanche maybe is known for the community putting like the th red, the red triangles on their Twitter handles, right? Uh, so all that is to say, like, how do you guys think about community in the context of blockchains? Like, how do you go about like where Avalanche's values maybe, if, or if you even believe that premise? It's a tough question. It's a good one, right? Um, I've I've sort of thought a lot about this, you know, as it relates to different ecosystems, because you know, one thing that we like to do in the space very often is like just put like three words on a chain or put three words on a community and be like, that's their stamp, you know? Like, you know, there's many different uh, elements of the Ethereum community. Like you got these, you know, the bankless side of it, you know, which is like the value of coal, whatever, ultra something money um, you got. And then, you know, you have the researcher community, which is just like, doesn't care about that stuff at all. Um, you know, and, and so it, it's interesting, but like at the end of the day, I guess they all do have some fundamental values that they, that they care about. From what I've observed, I guess, on Avalanche in general, um, I found that our community tended to be folks that, um, you know, had a very deeper understanding of technology, um, than sort of some of the others. And maybe that's why, like, I always tell people like nobody's better at flooding avalanche than our own community. We're pretty good at that um, because they're super, they're super, uh, you know, tech technical, and they're also quite, uh, you know, um, honest. And and so like I would just say we found, you know, the community's quite older than Solana. I would say like the average age I, I found has tended to be an older person than somebody on Solana. Uh, it's been a little more technical. I would say like avalanche communities tended to be more infrastructure. Those are like the legacy ones. What I've seen like sort of transition uh, and, and we're starting to catch on a little bit more lately um, is sort of uh, younger builders that are really interested in like customizing things. And that's that's been something like, especially on the university level, I've seen a lot of traction on as I'm, you know, sort of like starting to build out the DevRel team and stuff like that. So uh, I didn't answer your question at all um, because like, you know, I'm not part of the, I guess, the right triangle Illuminati, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a good one. I really don't have a good answer for it. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts too. I mean, like, I think the, uh, I think with a lot of these communities, they evolve over time. And my view on it is 
we want to give each community building a subnet its own space to be a community. So this has been actually a conversation that's happened a lot lately with subnets that I want you is like, they ask where they talk about like, how do we actually brand ourselves, right? Like, are we our, a one? Are we like part of Avalanche? Like, you know, because a lot of times when you say like you're part of something else, it, people feel it diminishes your own standing. So a lot of subnets have actually started to brand themselves as just like their own blockchains that have a connection or powered by Avalanche or something like that. Um, and I think it's important to allow these communities to um, really have their own identity. But the joke I always say is like, in my life, I've never seen like large groups of people agree on anything. And I think that like blockchain, when everyone has a finance, but arguably like a financial interest to not agree, like, I don't think this is the place where it's, where it's going to happen. Like we're going to achieve the singularity as a civilization and totally agree on everything. Um, and so uh, my approach to the community of the avalanche is to try and um, hopefully be as like neutral as possible to like, just really uh, the image I always show is like a Hydra, which is you're trying to always learn from everyone else. That's kind of pushing the same journey and then trying to, uh, really just stay current and like stay uh, technically in, in, innovative uh, on top of like what everyone else is also, you know, working on. The whole point here is that we're almost cu too customizable to a fault. And I think that like the flexibility is something that we're a little over flexible. And I think we need to have a clear kind of push towards a, a single narrative uh, because it gets tough to understand. It's like people are like, well, it's like this EVM thing. We're like, no, 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 not quite. And it's like, well, you're this like something thing. Well, there's also like, from, you know, like it's you just, there's a lot going on, and I think that we should uh, really try to push more clearly behind a single uh, single idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, my obviously incomplete uh, perception of the community would probably be like uh, kind of aligned with Luigi, like in, in, in the sense that it's more folks interested in infrastructure. I kind of just view it as more like B2B focused, like more enterprise, more professional. Uh, but then obviously I'm Turkish and so is Amin and and there's like a pretty loud Turkish community for at least loud. that's the one yeah that's the one I, I I see personally but that's probably maybe not your case I didn't, um, I didn't know you were Turkish yeah yeah that's uh I I tried to get Amin to come on the podcast by by uh by by replying to a comment in Turkish but it did not work um next time thanks. yeah um uh, Jared, do you want to do rapid fire yeah, let's go into it. Well, I, I just want to give my like my view of what was going on in Avalanche from like an extremely retail person. Like that's me. So this is what I would think the Avalanche. Like I remember Avalanche Rush, I believe I believe it was, right? And that's that's when I mean this is what every single ecosystem was doing when Avalanche Ru um first started. I don't know, it was probably a couple months into it. That's how you attracted a lot of new users and also projects. So like that was when Avalanche first hit like, you know, my Twitter feed. Um, and I started playing around there and you had like Trader Joe and other projects take off and it was really cool. And then I'd say the main narrative that's with me right now when I think about it is like tokenizing real world assets um, and some institutions coming on board. Like I, I forget if the partnerships with BlackRock or um, one of the big financial KKR. Services. Yeah, KKR. Um, and I think that's a really I don't I don't know if you're leaning into that still, but I feel like it's a really interesting niche because I don't think anyone's really capitalized on that. Like you've seen MakerDAO kind of try to do this. But I don't know. I, th I think, honestly, Avalanche, that to me is what's so attractive. It's like no one else is going after that. Also, the subnets, like, I think it's interesting. I think Base, a little contrarian, will probably be KYC eventually. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of people hate that because it's an L2 and it's raw. But it's like, why would you be an L2 if it's going to be KYC? I think Avalanche has a permissionless nature to it, but you also allow permission subnets. So, like, that's also something that's really interesting to me as a user. And, you know, if crypto takes off, hopefully institutions that need to either do KYC or have something where it's just geographic, right? Because I think that's one cool thing about subnets to be like all validators need to be in the US or Europe, et cetera. And you have a lot more flexibility. Um, so at like a really high level, not technical view. That's what I find interesting about Avalanche and like what I think about. Might hire you for branding. Um, <laughs> I, applied, <laughs> I, I applied for Avalanche role back in the day. It was BD. Did not, did not get it. So. Oh, you would have been on my team. All right. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, that, means you, that means you rejected him, right? <laughs> I didn't talk to Luigi. I don't know who I talked to. This is like May 2021. It was like, you know, things, probably things were popping. Probably John. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I think you nailed it. I think like the rough program is something I was pretty involved in, in helping bootstrap. And then, you know, I think RWAs is like, I'm, I have spent uh, a mind numbing number of hours this year on the fall with institutions, like 
if I counted them up, I don't know, I'd probably throw up. But basically, like, you know, I, I've learned a lot about, you know, that. And I think we are, we're not talking about it a lot, but like incredibly well positioned on that front. Uh, just given the team, uh, given sort of like the architecture and we understand it's a long sales cycle and sort of a very, you know, complex space to play. Like, yeah, you can customize validators by geographical location, but you could also customize them by whether or not they've used the sign with you. You know, like it gets pretty complex uh, in terms of like what you can and can't do. Um, and so I, we, we 100% will be leaning in and arguing for that. I'm sure. That's, that's definitely a focus. I mean, the, 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 the tagline is digitize the world's asset. All right. Well, let's have some fun. We'll be doing rapid fire. Um, we can go Luigi and then Patrick in order for every question. And Garrett might jump in and <laughs> ask like a, um, uh, what one of his questions as well. So I was like, what are you going right. to say there, Mert? Are you going to say, like, ask some <laughs> stupid question? <laughs> I, I was looking for the word, like, just not um, uh, out of related. the blue. I was going to say outside, yeah. but yeah. Tangential. Um, yeah. All right. Um, what does everybody get wrong about Avalanche? Uh, that it's an EVM clone. That is exactly what I was going to say. That is an EVM <laughs> like chain. I think Steven, uh, one of the co like one of the first engineers of the company, that's like uh, uh, the tagline is that Avalanche Go is like a fork of Ethereum, which it's not. It's like a framework for running virtual machines. So I'd say that I agree that that's like EVM is what people knew us for. I'm sorry, this is rapid fire. I'm going to stop. Yeah. So. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you fear the most when it comes to Avalanche? Oh, good question. Um, I see. I guess uh, my biggest fear is that uh, people won't want their own blockchain. Yeah, my fear is probably the uh, that the EVM ends up being like the only VM people want. What is your least favorite vertical in crypto? Or what do you think is the most overrated vertical in crypto? It might be a better way of phrasing that. Oh, boy. Uh, I need to be careful here. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess the most overrated vertical, in my opinion, is like... Fuck it, it's NFTs. I have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> not because they're not useful, but just, yeah, this is so overhyped, in my opinion. Mine is actually maybe even a hobby take than that, which is like I actually think like the time of like a lot of the like the real world aspect of like assets and stuff like that to digitally things multiplies if you're not careful the number of problems you have rather than like a fully digitally native option. So like I'm not from this world, so Luigi is, but like the idea that is like if I have a like so I can't tell you how many people coach me like I want to like someone that they they don't know like I want to tokenize property and it's like well <clears throat> you got the land deed now you need to insure that and then you have to work with the city and now you're gonna put like a blockchain on top of that it's like you already told you we're good at flooding ourselves didn't I tell you that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just more of a like I, I like more of the gaming like okay so what what is your favorite vertical in crypto I really like I'm sorry Luigi first I mean. I mean, obviously, DeFi. I'm, uh, I'm gaming. I have a, you can't see it behind me, but I actually have like a racing simulator rig I built behind me that I like. I love video games. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, what is your most unpopular take in crypto? My most the unpopular take I have is like, there's other ways to scale blockchains and L2s. Like, that freaks people out these days for some reason. Uh, all right, I guess I guess uh, right now my most popular take is that uh, a token does matter, and it will matter. Right now, maybe in like a year, it won't, it won't be unpopular anymore when the market goes back up. But right now, it's like, oh, dude, we're 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 no token launching, man. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I've got one, but Patrick, this might be perfect for you. Um, but would love to hear you, Luigi, as well. Um, okay, so you hear Avalanche talk a lot about the consensus mechanism. Like I mentioned earlier, it's extremely interesting. But I remember like on Twitter, you see all the time, consensus is not the bottleneck. So how do you respond to that? Uh, I'll start. Uh, consensus is not the only bottleneck is, the, is really the truth. The truth is that consensus is a bottleneck 
if you want uh, super fast finality and hide and centralization. If you want those two properties, the current or existing consensus is, consensus is we're, we're bottlenecks for sure. My view on that is consensus is still a bottleneck, but there are now more ways known to handle it such that it's not necessarily a differentiating the differentiating feature it used to be. So like obviously Ethereum has a lot of validators now, same with Solana, same with a bunch of other ecosystems, right? So like it's still a bottleneck. They didn't just like take what they had and just use it, right? Like it was still something that took a lot of thought. But I think that other ecosystems have done a lot more on consensus in the last few years that make it less differentiating. Right now I think the bottleneck that's shared by everybody that is not well handled yet is definitely the state state management story. Nice. If you weren't working on Avalanche, what would you be doing? Shit, I ask myself this every day. <laughs> in crypto? <laughs> no, no, just in no, general. anything. Oh. I'd probably, I'd probably be cooking something. Nice. I like to cook. But in crypto, in crypto if I wasn't working on Avalanche, I'd probably I'd probably go build like um, something in the social social fly space. I find that to be pretty interesting. Mine would be uh, building building cars. I think. Like, oh, nice! Either like control systems for like race cars or like uh, uh, something along that that line. Yeah, I'm not. I don't have any background in mechanical engineering or physics, and that is the real bottleneck for me in those areas. Uh, but I think like the same sort of like focus on high performance engineering, where like you have like this time right per lap that like. That's it. Like, it doesn't matter what the fuck you do. Like, you have one one thing you're optimizing for, and cars have become so much more technical these days that I think there's it's really it would be really challenging uh, and competitive to do. I think it'd be pretty fun. Big F one speed, I say kit. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy watching car racing going to. I think it's the most like the biggest difference between TV and like an event is racing right like for a long time i was even remotely interested in racing given i hadn't even been to something and then you go to a race and it's just totally different <laughs> like if you like i watched a nascar race in person and i was like round and really like the joke was like turn turn left like a hundred times yeah. but like you go to a real race like pretty nuts like these cars are full throttle like crashing into stuff at like 200 miles per hour it doesn't look that way on tv but in person you're like holy shit this is terrifying sorry yeah <laughs> Um, all right, last one from me. In five years, what do you hope Avalanche looks like? What is the ideal state? Yeah, so for me, like the goal is that people people are like seeing their own blockchains uh, with toggle click feature requests <laughs> that change basically, you know, the trade offs that they want to make, and it's similar to deploying your own AWS instance. Like that to me would be, you know, the dream goal. Uh, yeah. To me, it's like the, uh, I think it's like the aggregate value of elastic subnets, which are the subnets where you have a staking token, like in aggregate, maybe is at the level or exceeds that of Avalanche as a whole. Would be really interesting. It's a great answer. Well, guys, Patrick, Luigi, thanks for coming on today. I'm excited to see the Hyper SDK and just what gets built out in Avalanche. Also, the RWAs, like I said, I think super fascinating. Obviously, a lot of tribalism in crypto, but it's uh, nice to know there's so um, every ecosystem has great people in the space and always working towards something interesting. So, guys, thanks so much for coming on. This is a fun time. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. See you next time.